Now, listen, you think that you drink by choice, but what if I told you that you're actually part of somebody else's strategy? Welcome to the shocking nexus of alcohol and dopamine, where billion dollar companies know more about your brain's addiction circuitry than you do. And today, ladies and gentlemen, in this video, we are pulling back the curtain on the science and the schemes that keep you reaching for that very next drink. Trust me, after watching this, you will never look at the bottle the same way ever again. So stick around because you're literally going to liberate your mind and maybe even your entire life. And just before we get into the video, if you want more information on stop drinking coaching, please go and click the link in the description and book a call with our team. We've developed a system that works by reframing the way that you view alcohol using something called first principles thinking. And then we really focus on building a vision and focusing on the future instead of going to the past or doing AA or therapy or anything like that. It's completely different to all of that stuff. We've already worked with over 300 people. We've had clients from NASA, JP Morgan, Forbes, and in short, our stuff works. So if you want details, you can go to soberclear.com. You can read a bit more about the program and see the reviews. Or if you're ready to book a call, just please click the link in the description and do it here. And now let's get into the video. So firstly, alcohol companies have a very tough task on their hand. How exactly can you pitch a mild industrial poison like ethanol to somebody in such a way that they will happily agree to pay through the nose for it? Well, in two words, companionship and joy. Now, the next time that you see an alcohol advert on TV or in print, pay close attention. Chances are that you'll see a group of friends happily drinking together, having a great time. Lots of smiles, lots of people and beautiful surroundings. What they're never going to show you is a lonely man sipping away on his sofa in front of the TV. But sadly, that would be far more representative of these companies' actual best customers. See, what alcohol makers do is they invert reality. They want to make you believe that the alcohol is the driving force, the catalyst that allows the average Joe to then go and have fun with his friends. Now, the truth is, people are totally capable of having a good time socially without alcohol. Our brain is literally hardwired to derive pleasure from social interaction. Actions. As children, we literally had the best fun of our lives at countless social activities and parties, but we did it without so much as a drop of alcohol. The real reason that we drink alcohol is completely different, and you will never see it mentioned in any alcohol commercial. And it's this. Alcohol hijacks a primeval neuronal circuit in the brain called the reward system. And it's this hijacking that leads us to happily pay through the nose for this mass-produced industrial fool that also doubles up as a mild poison. And in some cases, to the point of completely destroying our health and our life. Now, let's unpack all of this. So what exactly is this human reward system? Well, there are two ways to answer this. Firstly, you can locate it in the brain. This is exactly what it looks like. Now, I'm going to spare you the anatomy here. For our purposes, what matters is what the brain circuit does to regulate human behavior. Evolution designed this system to encourage us to seek out things in our environment that were beneficial to our survival and reproduction. The so-called natural reinforcers. The main ones being food, especially calorie-rich food, and sex. Other natural reinforcers are water, sleep, and social interactions with loved ones. All the things that were beneficial to our survival and reproduction throughout human evolution. Now, the reward system is what makes us crave and seek out things like, for example, a juicy steak or a delicious piece of fruit or even an attractive member of the opposite sex. It links positive emotions to these things, ensuring that we will want to experience them again and again. Of course, this system evolved many thousands of years ago when we were living as hunter-gatherers in the savannas of Africa. Back then, there were no such things as ice cream, potato chips, fizzy drinks, social media, or pornography, which is why there's entire multi-billion dollar industries around these products today. See, what all of these products have in common is that they hijack the human reward system. They deliver an easily obtainable but massive supercharged reward up front. And this makes us seek out more of the same happily shelling out more and more cash. So in the process, we ignore the damage that these evolutionary novelties are doing to our health and well-being. Enter dopamine. So the chemical that these reward areas of the brain use to communicate with each other is the neurotransmitter dopamine. Now, I should clarify that neurotransmitter is any chemical that brain cells use to actually communicate with each other. So whenever you experience or even anticipate experiencing a rewarding stimulus, the reward system is activated, releasing dopamine. Compared to other neurotransmitters in the brain, dopamine is minor in terms of quantity. Only around 1% of brain cells use dopamine to communicate. But don't let this 1% figure fool you. Dopamine is critical to the normal function of our brain, our health, and our happiness. And not just for the proper functioning of the reward system. A number of human diseases are 
in one way or another linked to an imbalance or dysfunction in the brain's dopamine system, the most famous ones being schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. Now, another area where dopamine plays a prominent role is drug abuse. In one way or another, all drugs that can be abused recreationally stimulate the release of dopamine in the reward circuit. Some, like cocaine and amphetamines directly activate this system. In other words, they directly act on the dopamine containing neurons and stimulate them to release more dopamine. The brain then perceives these drugs as rewarding, leading to the person wanting more. But the drugs, however, act on the reward system indirectly. In other words, they act on remote brain regions, which in turn interact with the dopamine reward system. And alcohol is in this latter category. It works by enhancing the function of another neurotransmitter called GABA. And because GABA regulates the activity of the dopamine reward system, the end result is an increase in dopamine release, consequently activation of the reward system. And the takeaway here is that every time you drink alcohol, you activate this reward system, tricking the brain into perceiving this mass-produced industrial toxin as something rewarding and valuable to your survival. Now, until a few years ago, scientists actually believed that the reward system and dopamine are directly responsible for the feelings of pleasure that we experience from a natural reinforcer or a recreational drug like alcohol. But in recent years, they have realized that this is not exactly the case. So scientists broadly distinguish the subjective effects of recreational drugs into two domains, wanting and liking. I kid you not, these are the actual scientific terms that they use, wanting and liking. New drug users typically experience both wanting and liking. So you crave the drug, you take it, you enjoy the way it makes you feel. You want it and you like it. But as any smoker, drug or alcohol user will tell you, you can have wanting without liking. You feel like you could almost sell your soul for one more cigarette or a shot of whiskey. And then when you actually consume it, you don't even end up enjoying it. Neuroscientists and psychologists, today they believe that dopamine is involved more with the wanting than the liking part of the alcohol equation. So in other words, they believe that the stimulation of the dopamine reward system underlies the craving for a drink. It trains the organism to ascribe positive emotional value to the alcohol leading to these sometimes irresistible urge to consume it. But the very mild euphoria that comes from a drink is not actually related to dopamine. This liking is probably linked to alcohol's effect on other neurotransmitters, principally GABA and endorphins, which we've covered in other videos. So the reward system and dopamine are critical in the early phases of alcohol abuse. They are crucial in getting you hooked. Scientists have figured out this in various ways, not least of which are studies with rats. See, rats are very handy for scientists. You can do all sorts of stuff with them that you could never get away with in humans. So the scientists put the rats in a cage where they have access to a lever that administers alcohol, typically intravenously. The rats then press the lever until they become addicted to alcohol. Scientists found out after surgically destroying the reward system of these rats, you actually can't go on to develop addiction to alcohol. That being said, after the rats are already hooked on it, destroying their reward system does not affect their alcohol intake. They literally stay hooked on it without a problem, even without a functioning reward system. So it appears that dopamine is involved in giving you positive reinforcement in the early stages of drinking. This means that drinkers actively seek out the alcohol as a pleasant, positive reinforcement in and of itself. But here's the thing. Once you are well and truly hooked on alcohol, dopamine isn't so crucial in maintaining your addiction. Instead, the primary motivation for drinking is negative reinforcement. In other words, you start drinking to avoid the unpleasantness that comes from not drinking. This involves different neurotransmitter systems and is a topic that we partially covered in other videos. Now, there is one problem, however. By the time that you reach that point of negative reinforcement, your reward system is more or less fried with knock-on effects on all aspects of your life. Now, let's find out why this happens and the results. So the human brain is always striving for balance. It likes to keep things nice and neat within tightly predefined parameters. So when you have a few drinks, your brain gets busy trying to metabolize and expel the ethanol. It wants to get rid of it as quickly as possible and restore your natural state of equilibrium. Over time, however, the brain starts giving up. It basically decides to stop working against the alcohol and rather work with it. What this means is that the brain eventually decreases the levels of dopamine activity within the reward system. Since this 
part of the brain is constantly being artificially stimulated by alcohol, the brain turns down its baseline activity a notch, or rather a few notches. As a neuroscientist would say, the dopamine system becomes, quote, down regulated. Scientists can measure this down regulation in various ways. This includes imaging the brains of live people with PET scans, where you see that this area lights up less in heavy drinkers compared to non drinkers. Another method is looking at brain slices from deceased heavy drinkers. When you examine these tissue slices, you find that their concentration of dopamine molecules is decreased along with the number of actual dopamine receptors. These receptors are the protein structures on the surface of the brain cells to which dopamine molecules bind. It's through these receptors that dopamine activates the brain cells receiving the dopamine signal. So with fewer dopamine molecules tracing fewer receptors to activate, the end result is a substantial decrease in dopamine activity within the reward system. Now, this downregulation has a substantial impact on basically every aspect of the drinker's life. The topic is too large to cover in full here, so I'm just going to look at the two most important manifestations. Firstly, it's a decreased sensitivity to natural reinforcers. Sometimes you will find neuroscientists calling this reward dysregulation. Now, remember what we said earlier on when I first introduced you to the concept of the reward system? Well, the system is there to successfully process naturally pleasurable stimuli, the kinds that were present during the brain's evolution food, water, sex, sleep, relations with loved ones. Now, the characteristics of these natural reinforcers, apart from the fact that they are, well, good for you, is that A, there is a process to acquiring them, and B, the reinforcement you get is measured. Alcohol has neither of these two characteristics. It's an instantaneous reward. It's as simple as pouring yourself a measure of scotch and gulping it down. You don't have to actually go out and hunt or collect roots like our ancestors did. Or you don't have to put in any effort, for example, in maintaining a loving sexual relationship with your partner that will get you more sex. Instead, the alcohol is right there for the taking, basically 24-7. Not only that, but the reinforcement it gives is more or less instant and abnormally powerful. So depending on how much you drink, you can stimulate the reward system much more powerfully than natural reinforcers could. The result is that the brain is eventually trained to assign less value to natural reinforcers. The booze literally crowds out natural reinforcers out of the reward system. Now, PET imaging studies of chronic drinkers are very revealing in this respect. Compared to non-drinkers or recovered heavy drinkers, their reward system lights up less when presented with natural reinforcers like food or erotic images of the opposite sex. In contrast, their reward system is activated more when presented with alcohol-related cues, like the photo of an alcoholic beverage. I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything more depressing than this. Literally a life where you derive lower levels of pleasure from such great things. Literally all to keep consuming a drug that gives you ever diminishing levels of pleasure in and of itself. Literally a destroyed reward system to go hand in hand with a destroyed body. As bad as reward dysregulation is, things can get even worse after you stop drinking. And especially during the early phases of withdrawal from the drug when the artificial boost to the dopamine system is removed and downregulation is then exposed. Scientists call the resulting phenomenon anhedonia. It's a two-part term, an meaning without, and idoni meaning pleasure. So a complete or partial inability to derive pleasure from things. One researcher defined it as, quote, a loss of interest or pleasure in almost all usual activities and pastimes. Anhedonia was first observed in clinically depressed people, as well as those with schizophrenia. But it's also very common among chronic drug abusers, including drinkers. And in heavily addicted individuals who stop consuming the drug, it becomes almost universal. Psychologists break it down into two components. Firstly, motivational anhedonia is when the person has no desire to engage in activities that they once found enjoyable, and consummatory anhedonia is when the person actually engages in the activity, but they get little to no pleasure from it. In recovering heavy drinkers, the anhedonia phase will typically last a few weeks. Then the brain will slowly start to recover, and the anhedonia will go away. Which brings us on to the final topic in today's video. Restoring your reward system after you stop drinking. So, what about the recovery after drinking? Well, there is no treatment for a hypo-functioning reward system. Pharmaceutical companies haven't yet come up with a pill that you can pop and magically restore your dopamine levels after chronic alcohol abuse. And the only remedy is time. Just like your reward system got gradually dysregulated with alcohol over time, it will gradually recover once you stop drinking. And the good news is that with enough time, the reward system will make an almost complete recovery, often back to its pre-drinking levels. The 
recovering drinker will one day notice that for the first time in years, they're enjoying things again. Something simple such as riding a bicycle or playing with their child. Whilst this process naturally plays out, the recovering drinker can be supported by specific types of psychotherapy called activation therapy. This is a very practical, hands-on type of treatment. The person works together with their therapist to slowly reintroduce positive, formally rewarding activities in their life. Things like trying out a new restaurant, exercising, socializing, and so on. As Thomas Jefferson famously said, there is not a truth existing which I fear or would wish unknown to the whole world. And when it comes to your reward system and alcohol, the truth is this. Though for all practical intents and purposes, your reward system will eventually rebound back to its pre-drinking levels, some changes can never be completely undone. And the most striking symptom of this is what will happen if you ever have so much as just one drink. Scientists aren't exactly sure how, but even after years, after decades of abstinence, the reward system of recovered drinkers will process the the drink in a completely different way to non-drinkers. The reinforcement that they derive from that one drink will be immense, and their alcohol-seeking behavior will come back with a vengeance. Just like that, and all the years of sobriety will then count for nothing. In a very subtle but irreversible way, you can always be a tiny bit different from somebody who never drank. If you click the video on the screen now, you can learn why a drinking problem exists with a totally new system for you to gain control.